to Enlightenment of Change on webtalkradio.com. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. You know that I'm excited that you're joining us this week. Now, here's the deal. You know, as we go through life, and my guests and I, we get this change. We hear that word change and we go, yikes, what do I do now? Especially if the change is thrust upon us, right? COVID, that was thrust upon the whole world. So sometimes we can and we choose change and sometimes we don't. So to help you navigate whatever change you're going through, I believe that at the core to help us navigate that change in life, business, whatever it might be, we have to communicate effectively. So in the show notes, I have a link for a communication, my communication style assessment. It's my gift to you. You'll get two reports. The first report will spotlight your highest score, which is kind of your natural superpowers as it relates to communication and how your message is landing flip side, your lowest score, you'll get a report on that one as well. That is typically a blind spot in how we communicate. So pay attention to that report. I think more importantly than our superpowers, because when you're speaking with people 180 degrees different than you, how is your message landing? We kind of want to know that, especially if there's angst in the change that you're going through, easy of communication could be a real blessing. So again, that link is in the show notes, my gift to you. Now, to set the stage for the conversation with my guests today, my quote is by Dwight D. Eisenhower, and he says, the supreme quality for leadership is unquestionable integrity. Now, through my career and business, I, I got to tell you, I've dealt with some amazing leaders and those that, let's just say, have left me feeling bad for the employees <laughs> at my client's location. And, you know, I've also learned that leadership isn't necessarily about titles. It's about the vision and strength to lead teams to whatever that greatness is or whatever the objective is for the person and the organization. For me, it boils down to this idea of win, 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 right? If And within that philosophy, the leader wins, right? Because now they can delegate more, their team performs more. The employee wins, right? Because they might get promoted and, and grow skills. And the company wins because at the end of the day, when you have that philosophy at work, the organization wins from a profitability standpoint. So this is kind of important. So what holds leaders back from their own greatness and then that ripple effect to the greatness of their employees? This is an important question. And of course, we're going to dissect it and talk about it today. My guest today is Glenn Akramoff. Now, Glenn is the visionary founder and CEO of Akron. I hope I'm saying this right, Glenn. Akramoff LLC. It's, he's a leading expert in rehabilitating and revitalizing municipal government uh, workplaces. With a career spanning over three decades, Glenn's journey from seasonal maintenance to city manager has been a testament to his unwavering commitment to building purpose-driven workplaces centered around humanity. Amen to that one. His core belief is that fulfillment at work leads to happiness in life, and he has dedicated himself to improving the lives of individuals and organizations alike. His expertise lies in workplace culture, human-centered workplaces, building winning teams at work, generational opportunities, and local government operations. His innovative human-centered program empowers teams and leaders to collaborate, communicate, and excel together, ensuring every mem member of the staff performs op optimally um, in their role. So Glenn, thank you so much for coming and taking the time uh, to spend with us today. And I'm excited about our conversation. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, really. This, I'm telling you, Glenn, this is an important topic through my own career, I've had bosses who have yelled at me, called me an idiot, you know, to my face. And again, I grew up in the eighties, so it's, yeah. it's a lot different than it is, right? The whole world would be up in arms, yeah. but it, it's real. And I've seen it and I know you've seen it and it's not okay to treat people like that because we lose productivity um, at the end of the day. Right. So talk about your journey um, to your business today, because that's quite an interesting little trajectory. <laughs> right. Um, well, it I started as a a frontline employee in um, in both private and in, in local government, and I worked my way up through the through the ranks as I got on a full time job in local government. Which, of course, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, it's that's awesome. You know, that's a great steady job." Yes, it is but many of the municipal governments are toxic workplaces. So that that's a challenge. So what got me going was watching that play out. Um, 
I was working at one that was toxic. It was one of my, it was actually my first full-time gig. And I watched um, the organization not know how to handle um, folks who were struggling. And I had two really close friends who very much struggled. And um, um, the, the environment ate them alive and um, for different reasons. One of them, I don't know where he is, still don't know where he is. The second one committed suicide. Oh, God. And it can be directly related to what happened in the workplace. And so, or what didn't happen to, right? And uh, I think, you know, you, as you mentioned, you, you yelling and all that stuff, you know, I grew up in the 80s and started into the workplace in the 80s too. And, and you know, that was com more common than it is today, but it's still going on. And um, it is not acceptable because yeah. it it hurts people. And that's, that's, what's got me to where I'm, where I'm going. The interesting part is, you know, you're in government and then you become an entrepreneur. And I did because I wanted to start my own business. And the reason I did is I wanted to impact more people. I had some skills. I had some abilities to do that. And I found I, I was doing pretty well and I wanted to impact more people. And that's why I started the business and learned a whole new set of skills as part of that process. It's so funny, Glenn, you know, I've been in business almost 23 years. And when COVID hit, I had done everything live. I spoke live. I trained live. I networked live. I met people. Right? I did everything live. And then the world stopped. And I remember my husband, his company closed and I had no income and we had two kids in college. And I remember, you know, one of those deep breaths where you think yeah. I'm going to go and vomit now because I don't know what I'm doing. Right. right. But I remember saying to my husband, holy crap, what, and remember when it first March of 2020, we didn't know whether it was a day, whether it was two weeks, whether it was two years, we didn't know what we were facing. Yeah. So I remember, you know, you got to self-evaluate because it starts with you. And I remember I said to my husband, thank God we had money in the bank. And he had a, a package at the end when the company closed. So we had money in savings. That's always what I tell people before you open a business, make sure you always have money yeah. in savings because yeah. things go wrong, right? You don't have income Absolutely. coming in. So I remember saying to him, I don't know what I don't know, but I can tell you this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now 62 when COVID hit, what was I 59? And I said, I don't know this technology. I don't know this digital world. I don't know what platforms to put my stuff on. I have to take classes and I'm gonna have to spend money to educate myself because otherwise do I just close my business? These are big questions, right? Remember yeah. change I said at the beginning, yeah. that yeah. change was thrust upon all of us. But it's interesting that you said, be shifting from, you know, a, a job to becoming an entrepreneur, you know, 23 years ago, I went through that. And now in 2020, it was like the whole world had changed. Interesting how I think if you're resilient and you're open and curious to learning and you become a lifelong learner, for me, I just pivoted and thought, what don't I know digital, right? This electronic stuff, right. I need to learn that. And how can I incorporate it? Because I still knew how to run a business, but I just didn't know how to do it digitally. So being open to learning and and you never know what you don't know and what's right. coming up around the corner. So right. you really kind of have to be fluid and open to good stuff and bad stuff happening because, you you know, we make mistakes along the way, um, of course, as well. So it's just it interesting is. that you said that because I felt that in 2020, like, I don't know anything. I'm a, I'm a blithering idiot. And of course, I didn't. I was in business 20, almost 20 years then. So right. just interesting perspective through our brain. Now, let, let I want to ask you another question. What mistakes or challenges have you faced and whether through your career or now being a business owner, kind of going in and putting spotlights on situations or organizational structures. Yeah, I, I think the 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 most recent mistakes in the in the in the business um, were was that I you can easily get too broad, right? You can get broad and and not stay focused on what you're really good at mm -hmm. because people are trying to you know, they want services. And if you have a reputation as a business owner and and some people will ask you to do things that are a little outside of what you like to do and maybe what you're good at. Um, we did that in the company, right? I, I started looking at, wow, we can, we can help here. My technical ability allows me to do this, but I realized that's not where I'm passionate about anymore. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. And I'm passionate about the people and the culture and getting organizations, you know, flying high. And so I, I did that. And then, and then what happens is um, your, your passion goes a little bit and then people don't 
don't feel your passion and don't hire you as often. So that happened. Um, the second was I got a little bit ahead of my my market. Um, I I knew I had things that people kept telling me they wanted from me. And so rather than have the commitment first, I went and took took a few risks. And uh, what it was, was I uh, a workshop. I do a lot of workshops. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted, to, everyone says, you got to do a leadership one. So I set it all up and then tried to get people into it uh, and didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you get a little, you know, you get a little arrogant and you say, well, I, I this is going to happen. And, and then you take a risk that wasn't a good risk. Yeah. Um, but I do think entrepreneurship is risk. You have to know when to take them and when not to, yeah. um, career wise. Um, it's been such an evolution. And like you said, I, I, I have shifted. I, I, I took a journey from a seasonal maintenance worker and then all the way to a city manager. And I did that in, in less than 20 years. And, um, and I, I don't say that because I'm cocky about it. I say that because I want people to know if I did it, you can do it if you, you Absolutely. want. Absolutely. And, and, but I learned so much and had to learn so many skills. And like you said, be so flexible and realize that I can learn something. This is something my dad told me from when I was young. You can learn something from anyone. And I took that to heart and I learned skills that, and, and, and little tidbits from people that, that you would think, you know, how would you learn that from them? You know, some of the best mentors I've had were frontline employees who were maintenance workers who were dirty every day, um, didn't have a, a, if you looked at it from the outside, they didn't have a wonderful life. If you talked to them, you knew they were very happy. And they gave me some some motivation, some tidbits that really allowed me to be where I am today. And you know, it's funny, every time I train or teach sales, right? My world is sales. And um, somebody will share a story. And you know, sometimes I get emotional with them because it's moving when they they really mm -hmm. help a client and you think, Wow, that you felt the need to help do whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, I learned so much or they'll say something and I think, oh my gosh, I love how that sounded, that phraseology, I'm stealing it. And I always go, but I'm going to give you credit when I, when I share it, <laughs> but I learned so much. And I think as a leader, it's important that, and you, and you kind of alluded to this, but I think we have to be curious to learn and curious and open to other people's perspective that are different than ours, right? These workers had a very different job than you, but they had a very different perspective in their day-to-day -day life. And yet you were curious and you learned what happiness is, even though the outside looking in, right? They're dirty and they're, but they're yeah. happy. So isn't yeah. that the name of the game in life yeah. to, to freaking yeah. be happy and not be measured by, you know, success, whatever that means to you like you said, by the stature in life, but what do we feel in our heart? So I think that curiosity and being open to people, right? Because the employees are learning from me. Some of them are in their thirties. They don't know what I know in my sixties, but what do, do they know that I don't know? So I think having that open mind becomes critical. And I think it, as a leader, if we're not very dangerous. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, we, we talked, you talked when you started about the toxicity in the your the government where you were working and and people that you don't know where the one is and the one later on committed suicide which is just heart wrenching to it hear is. because there there just should never that should never happen right there should always no. be an alternative but what what have you learned again being part of that and now trying to change that toxic workplace how do you define it I just always like to set so people understand where you're coming from sure um, I think the the there's a couple of key things. There are key signs, and then there, there's w a way to define it. So, so key signs nowadays are certainly turnover. Mm. Um, there are certainly um, you will see production drop, um, and and you can see in people's faces the tension and the um, um, disheartened or loss of hope. Actually, I think is yes. it goes that far. Um, so, so what, what really defines that is that, uh, the, the, the vision and the mission of the company does not align with the vision and mission of the human beings in it. Yeah. And that can be everyone, believe it or not. So we get so, you know, part of the business is to make money. 
right? And and government, we didn't have to make money, but we we had to provide lifetime service, right? That's a little different thing, but it's it's similar. And so that's why you're in business. But if you get too focused on that, then everyone loses the reason they're there, because money is only only goes so far in in creating happiness. Um, and and you know, there's tons of studies on that. But the so that so that's one of them. The other one is that a couple others. One is that you you don't know what winning means, so that it's not defined. So you don't know when you do well or not in a certain company, and that starts to create toxicity. Um, so that is a big one. And then um, I believe the the other one is is undefined expectations. Mm. or and they tend to be different right it, people will say well i you know i think i know what i'm supposed to do well you might and you might do the same thing as your peer next to you and they get more accolades than you do and you might perform at the same level why the expectations are inconsistent and different so defining those um for yourself and for the organization are incredibly important when those things don't happen then as human beings, we will fill the gaps mm -hmm. and we start to fill the gaps with, unfortunately, we tend to focus on the negative more than the positive. So we fill the gaps with negativity. And then there are people who are not in a great space in their life. And, and I don't judge that. And that's one of the things I've learned that we talked about earlier is that people, they, they want to have, have a, a tribe. They want to have people feel what they feel. And so if people are miserable in a, in a workplace and there is a gap, they'll try to fill it with that so they can feel a part of it. Mm. And it's not, it's not, it's not because they have malice. Some do, but very few do. Most of the time it's because I, I just, I don't feel good at things are not going well. And, and I see an opportunity to have people feel what I feel and mm. I want them to. And so then and that's where the negative employee comes from or the negative employees. Yeah. And again, you talked about being curious. That's what a great leader does is not, not say, I need to get rid of this person, but says, why are they that way and how can I help them? And so that's, and that's how you start to, you know, that's how you identify. And that's, those are the key components of a toxic workplace. Yeah. And, and you gotta, you gotta ask, right. For me in sales, I, I tease when I, when I teach like one of the skills with sales is you have to have targeted open-ended questions, not just random open-ended questions. They have to be really framed out. And, but you, those open-ended questions, who's doing the talking after I ask it, the client, you have to be curious because I could say, you know what you need? And I don't know the first thing about you. How do, how could I potentially know what you need? And you might not need X, Y, Z. You might need ABC for my, for my offering. So again, that curiosity, I think as humans, we, we have become maybe less curious because our opinion is the right opinion and we just want to be heard. We don't really want to listen to anyone else. And I think that's really dangerous because I think curiosity is where we create innovation, where we create camaraderie, where we create that community of belonging. We're humans. We are tribal. We yeah. want our community. We want to feel needed and wanted and respected. And I think that when we forget that, well, that's not your job. Your job is to do are we there just to do a job? And and Gallup just came out with another poll, which is really sad because they did one in 2015, 20, and they've done a recent one. The number's not changing, Glenn. It's something like 73% um, of Americans hate their job and are disengaged at work. And I think it's like 17% show up and say, oh no, I love my job and I'm engaged. That's a problem. Like That's to me, problem. those statistics should should be really reversed. And it's not for lack of information. There's books and, and podcasts and tons of information on the internet about leadership and good leadership. Pick what works for you. But now you, you another aspect is the government. So we're seeing it not just in corporate America, but in we, I, I've had I had a client who was an executive director of a non for profit and the toxicity there. We tried to do team building and stuff. It was bad. And now with so what I'm hearing is guess what humans are humans, no matter what your job role or organizational structure is. So it's it's scary. Yeah. What how. How is change initiated and sustained when you come from this very, like you're describing, 
this toxicity. And we blame the employee as being the toxic one, but they're seeking their community again to feel belonging. So how do you change all of this um, to sustain non-toxic environments and growth? Yeah, I, I think the uh, one of the key parts, of course, is leadership. Um, I, I think at this point we have leaders who are worn out and they're, they don't know what to do. And there's so many raw laws and regulations that they feel like restrict them. They don't necessarily, but that's how they start to feel. Mm. So, so to start the change process, you've got to, to humanize everything and that, and, and every business that I know of, um, is set to set up to serve humans in some way. So if you're not serving your employees, and this has been proven and said all over the place, if you're not serving your employees, they're not serving your customers in a way that is positive. That flows through. Absolutely. So I think it, it the the key to all of change is is telling each person and and getting them to understand what's in it for them as an individual first. There is an I in team. Let's be really clear that if the individual is not successful, the team will not be. So it ha you, that's how I define, you know, the I in team. And so you have to start there. And like you said, you know, co there are some changes that are thrust upon us. Um, and we, you know, my program talks a lot about external forces, which is those things that we can't control that are pushed on us. Absolutely. But, but the, the change process, we know we need to change. We knew we needed to change in, in COVID. We didn't know what that was going to look like in the first days, but everybody started to um, to move in that direction. The most successful people were able to to you know, like your example, were okay. I need to learn something. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm going to start focusing on that. Um, and they got out of the limbo that it created. Right, it, it, we were all in kind of a floating space. That's right. And the people who were most successful got out of that space as fast as they could. And many organizations didn't. Most actually didn't. Certainly in local government, they did not move out of it um, very quickly. Government's known for that. <laughs> and and, they, and it's a, a reputation well-earned. But I, I think that's the big thing when you're doing the change process. And I, I, I have a graphic that I use sometimes that I call it the change road. And... And you can go either direction on the change road, but you start with that process of, of, of people notice, okay, we, we know we need to change. We don't want to. And then you kind of, you know, the resistance starts and then you kind of move through the road and, and, and the ultimate is the celebration of, um, of we made it through the change mm -hmm. and that, and when everyone says that they're like, you know what, that was awesome for us to have made those changes. But between those two, you can go all the way up to where you're just about to celebrate and some individual or, or a part of the team will go all the way back to resistance again. Mm, mm. And so it's understanding that it's like a mourning process because you have to mourn the, the old way and then you have to embrace the new way. And that's an interactive process that is very complicated because we're human beings and our emotions get involved. Yeah. And so that is the the thing is that it's a it's a process that us humans have to go through it's an emotional one one of the things that i've noticed is we've tried to take emotions out of the workplace which will never be successful because we're human beings and we're emotional beings yeah so those are the key things to getting change moving once people realize you know what I, i'm not going to lose here because that's the fear and you got to get the fear out of the process i'm not going to lose here I'm, I'm going to, the change is going to help me. I just need to figure out, or I need someone to help me understand how and what that's going to look like. Then they will start to, to move forward and be a part of the process. If I don't know what to do, Glenn, I don't know what to do. That's so right. someone shines a light on that. I don't know what that next step is. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm lost. And then someone shines a light or you hear someone say something and you curiosity, wait, yeah. what did you say? I've been looking for the answer to that. It's that shining light. So I know what that next step is. And here's the other thing you mentioned this before, but it's about failing forward, right? In your business, you created the program and then when looking for the people, this is such a common mistake that, that business owners that we do as entrepreneurs 
entrepreneurs um, that we make, it's common and you heard it and you knew it, but you did it. Well, I did the same thing. Yeah, so it's, yeah. we're humans. And, but, but I think at the end of the day, you have to be willing to seek a solution to whatever, because if change is here, I can't change that, right? I know it's yeah. here, like COVID. I knew my business had stopped. What was the alternative? Sit there and cry and watch Netflix all day? That's yeah. not me, because I believe that action creates reactions and then things find you when you're in motion, whereas you're stagnating, you're stagnating. And it's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking when COVID hit, I had, I started networking like a mad woman with other business owners, because we were all on, we were learning. I was in these classes. I was networking, meeting people. Oh, that's an interesting topic. And then they'd put you in breakout rooms. I was meeting people I never would have met around the world, not just right. in New Jersey right. or the United States. Fast forward, they're referral partners now where I have one young lady out in St. Louis. We became friends over the past three, four years. Yeah. And she had a, a client and she goes, Con, not my zone of genius. Can you come in? Here's the situation. We met with the client together and we're doing business together with him. Now he needed both of us and was very open because he trusted her. Now he trusts me, but right. I'm getting business that I never would have had through small business owners. Cause I was always in corporate doing everything live. But so you have to sometimes look back and measure Okay, COVID sucked. Let's face it. It was horrible. Yeah. I lost a dear friend, right? We all lost yeah, people. It was not good. It was not good. There was, but the good did come from it when you pause and you kind of, there's always that silver lining. And when I look back now, these partners that I've made, they're friends that I never would have had. What a blessing just in that. But we're doing business together because we build that no like trust factor together as we were all learning, by the way. Right. But we saw each other's zones of genius opportunity is always there, Glenn. But that fear, I think that fear when change comes and debilitates us or the toxicity, because it's, I want my community, right? I want people that are feeling what I'm feeling. We, we as leaders have to understand the human factor, emotional quotient, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we have to understand it. We have to address it because you're not going to change an organization or make it more profitable or, address the needs of your clients changes in their life and whatever needs they have, unless we're changing on the back end. So it all fits together. Each of us individually has a, we're a puzzle piece, right? Of To, to whatever that tapestry or trajectory looks like. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you, and I know you talk about this is morale is mentioned a lot. We have low morale, we have high morale. But it's never defined. Do you, right. can you define that for us? Because I think this is another piece of the puzzle that we use these phraseology, but we're not really understanding the, the impact. Yeah, I, I, I started that every place I go when I started this business, that was the first thing everyone said. They said three things that, that really, um, we don't communicate well which is why I really liked your communication in the lead in yes, the, the, um, the second is accountability and that comes from leadership and a lot of other things. And the third was our morale sucks. And so I'd ask, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, we're not happy. That's what I got most of the time. So I, and I looked for definitions and couldn't find one. So I created one um, myself and, um, and it was kind of what's, you know, what's important to me. And then I tested it with all my clients and it, becomes really clear. So there, there's six parts to it. I, I actually, in the, in the visual I have, I, I try to use a star because I think the reason I like that symbolism is because if you do all these things, you will be a star organization. I love you, that. You'll be on the top. So the first one is accountable leadership. The leadership has got to be accountable to everybody. And, and they've got their, their answer has always got to be that starts with me. Um, and, and, and model what accountability actually is like the next one's inspired vision. We need, you need to be able to know what we're doing as an organization is important and your job and your role. And it is important. Again, that comes from leadership. Um, the next ones we talked about communication, action-based communication, not just talking to talk, but, but knowing that there's going to be an action coming from it. Yep. And, um, and then the next one is individual development. As an individual, like I said, the, there is an I in team and the individual has to be developed. And if they feel they're dead ended and they're not going to learn, even if they stay in the same career for 30 years, they want to learn and they want to know new things and they need to be developed. And so an organization has to be set up that way. 
the next one we talk we talk a lot about this. This is this is out there a lot right now, and that's well being, safety, well being, mental health. Yeah, that whole part of it. If if people are healthy in every way, um, and the organization feeds them positively, then then morale will be high. And the last one is your accomplishments need to be meaningful. What you're what you do every day needs to mean something to you and to to someone else. And if you have all all of these six things, then everyone is flowing really well. Things are going well. Toxicity cannot get in if all six of them are are going well. Absolutely. Um, and so that's when we when we focus on morale and we focus on our culture work. Those are the six things that we work on with an organization. And I, I you know, people say, well, that takes years. No, it can take weeks. Um, if all of these things start to be put in in place. And, and it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. That's. I was going to say, but you said it before. It's not just talking the talk. We got to walk the walk. We got to live, breathe it, make yeah. it part of the daily culture, the communication. We have to say it, but then implement and do it. And we as leaders have to be the catalyst, right? Mm -hmm. To for pe people want to buy in but they have to trust you to be able to buy in. So if you're saying, well, this is what we're going to do, but then you go and do the opposite. Well, then why should I do it? Like, what am I, what am I, the, 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 the low man on the, on the doormat. So people have to be valued, um, which I think is in, is really important too. And it's funny. The other thing you said, which I agree with, you know, I've been in sales 40 years. I've been in sales 40 years. Yeah. Think about that four yeah. decades in yeah. sales. But here's the thing I could sit with an organization I have my questions because I know I framed them in 40 years. I've kind of refined that skill. Right. But yeah. when I sit with them within minutes, I could tell them, I understand. Here's where we need to, the, you want to get here. I get that. But you, you're you not nearly there because you've never done any training or you've never had a culture. Or you've just merged whatever's going on in the organization. This is where we really need. And they look at me and they go, how did you do that? 40 years in sales. Right. I have 40 years of being curious, 40 years of listening and growing my listening. All of that happened over 40 years. Was I doing this when I was 22? No way. I didn't know what I didn't know. I was I was a 22-year-old finding my way and blind to what those steps were. So I think that's the other piece of it, as we have to give that opportunity to our employees. Otherwise, if they're not growing, they're dying on the vine. So we could have these grandiose objectives within our culture, but if I'm not helping my people grow, what's the point? We want to wake up every day and excited about, I'm going to learn, or I can't wait. I'm going to practice with whatever the skill is. Um, we need our people to be excited, but we need to be excited yeah, about yeah. what we're building. So it all becomes the ripple effect. As you were talking, I was thinking the ripple effect, a ripple effect could be super positive, that ripple effect could be damaging um, as well. So that center point, you as the, the leader, what, what is the ripple that you're creating outwardly? And you got to take responsibility if you're in a leadership position. And when I train and I teach coaching to my managers and executives, you know, whatever we're building the culture. And I always say, you, you have to be curious. You have to Exit, you have to live and breathe and show, don't just tell, you got to show them. You have to live and breathe it. You have to show them it working and then make sure that you're giving them the skills necessary. Just because I'm in, in sales 40 years, right? You, you've you been in, in government and other leadership positions for two, three, four decades um, mm -hmm. as well. I can't expect a 22 year old to know what I know. That's yeah. pretty unfair. Yeah, absolutely it is. For so sure. it, 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 this all goes together. Um, last question, because we're out of time, but sure. what workplace trends, because I know you're doing a lot of research behind the scenes as well, but what workplace trends do you see really kind of going into 2024 that we should be mindful of as leaders? Uh, number one is the fact that the generation generational stuff is impacting the workplace mm. the the two the two younger generations the millennials and the gen zers or whatever they're going to ultimately be named yes um will not they don't tolerate the workplace that we came into in the 80s and they certainly don't tolerate um poor leadership um and so and and it's our fault that we have poor leadership because we're not training people we're throwing them in there because they're technical people and 
um, they take on leadership and they're trying their best, but they're not trained and they're not, you know, like you said, they don't have curiosity. They don't know that that's an important thing. Yeah. So we've got to, we've got to do better there. Um, I also see the, the, the national tension that was created by COVID and the, you know, everyone picked a side and picked a tribe and, and that's typical Yep. is, is starting to fade in the workplace. People are starting to realize I don't I don't care what their you know their political vent is nationally. I need to work with this person and and I know I've gotten to know them and they're good people. What what I'm being told about if you believe X then you are Y is in, untrue. So people are starting to realize I need to I, I like this person and I'm not going to be told that I shouldn't like them because of that. And so that is actually having a positive ripple effect, of course, on each of the workplaces. Um, and I've seen that over the last start to evolve over the last part of 23. So that's exciting for me. That That's awesome. We can build on that. Agreed. Um, the other part, the third one is that our leadership is transitioning fast. It's transitioning from our generation, yours and mine, and, and those before us uh, quickly to, to millennials. And they they are not jumping into it with uh, enthusiasm. The ones who are taking the jobs are, but but some of them are being forced. Hey, you're, it's your time to lead. Well, I don't really want to, and it's it's only because of what they've seen over the last five or six years that's made them doubt whether they want to be a leader or not. Yeah, and they're not seeing the benefits of being being a leader um, and what impact you can have on other human beings. And we need to help them with that. But that's definitely a trend that I've seen because one of the things I do is I come in and I sometimes I'll come in and take over as the leader and then I'll hire someone to take my place and keep the work going. Yeah. And I have had to hard recruit some people who are in the next generation because they're like, I don't want that. I, I that'll I, I've seen people get eat alive. I just see there's there's no positive there. Um, and so it takes a big convincing. Um, so those are the three big things I see coming in 24. And I have to tell you, you know, I have two boys and they're Gen Z, you know, they're both in the workplace doing great in their careers because mm -hmm. they're hard workers. Cause I'll kill them if they don't. Right. I'm not... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you said, you know, like this, when they first got the jobs, I'm like, and if you're asked, right. Cause they were hourly or whatever, right. Yeah. after college, you know, entry level yeah. stuff. If they ask you, can you work overtime? Your resp I don't care what you have planned. Your response is, sure, I can. Sure, I can. you want to learn this? Sure, I do. I said, you learn and you build your resume. That's your job in your 20s. Forget about this. I better love what I do. It doesn't exist yet because you don't know what you want to do. You're in your 20s. Trust me right. on this, right? We don't yeah. know what we don't know. Like, my kids just laugh. We, we know, mom, right? But yeah. here's the other thing. I saw a statistic recently on the sales, right? Because I kind of follow sales, the sales trends and um, CEOs that are approached by salespeople, they say 84% of the time they feel that the person showing up is ill-prepared and not trained well. So we're, and it's exactly what you're saying. It's the same thing, just on the leadership side. We're throwing people into these jobs, but we're not giving them the education or the tools to be able to execute. And, you know, back in the 80s, I remember my first sales manager. He was great at sales. He was a high producer. They promoted him into management. He should not have been managing people. He was horrifying. Literally, we didn't be in a car. I didn't make the sale because I didn't know anything, right? I was an idiot at 22 learning, trying to figure things out. We'd get in the car. You're an idiot. You're never going to make money. Why don't you quit now? You're a loser. It was mm -hmm. the gamut. And I, I, thank goodness that I had enough, um, not confidence, because I wouldn't say I was confident, but I had enough uh, self-love maybe to say, yeah, all right, all right. I would let him yell at me and then I would go and I would handle my clients the way I felt <laughs> that I wanted right. to nurture and love them. Not the way right. he was like, go in and make this out, right? That wasn't me. And I've, in 40 years, I've never been that way. But it goes back to what you were saying. We promote people. They've been here the longest. They're the right age. You know, they're a good producer. Let and they should yeah. not be managing people yeah. either. So as leaders, we have, we have to kind of know our talent pool and yeah. use people who want to do it and then give them the tools to do it. Because that statistic of 84% showing up ill-prepared or not, um, not trained well enough, mm -hmm. that's not okay. Because training people on the back end is the easy part. And then holding them accountable and all of the, the pieces of your star um, that you mentioned are critical.
all for us to be successful long term. It's got to be sustainable. Otherwise, we're on a treadmill going nowhere. Right, Glenn? Yeah, yeah. that that 84 percent, I think, is directly re- related to the 73 percent you mentioned earlier. That's right. I uh, Oh, they, they're they definitely connected. Yeah. If we j- dug deep enough, I bet some of the same uh, angst behind yeah. it is is truly there. So, yeah. you know, the organizations, leaders, I, and I, I know when I teach my coaching um, to, to leader, to leaders in, in the organizations I work with, I say, do you understand this is your biggest responsibility within your organization is to bring up that next generation? Who yeah. are your future leaders? You, we don't want to lose them to the competition dangerous, but also it'll make your job easier and they're going to love you. They're going to follow you. They're going to, they're going to show up for you, but we got to be in this together. We have to have that mutual respect. And I, I, I think the younger generations are demanding it, which I give them credit that they're courageous enough to leave jobs because you know what, you're not listening to me or you're not giving me the skills I need and they're not afraid to leave. So I do I, I do find the courage of this younger generation kind of awe inspiring because we didn't have that. Our, our role was get a job, have benefits, have a 401k. It's all sucking too bad. You have a page, <laughs> you That's have right. a 401k That's exactly. and you have that, right? It didn't matter yeah. that you were soul sucking and you dragged your butt to, to work every day. So it just, yeah, it's a different no. world. Um, I, I, I love them for it. I really me do. too. I, I truly am awe inspired every day. And I, I really reach out to younger people to hear their thoughts on different things. That doesn't mean I always agree and I'll challenge them and share. And then you share your perspective and they go, well, that makes sense. And I'm like, percolate on it. I'm a little smart for a 62 year old. Like, listen, I have some wisdom in here. Yeah. Um, but they have wisdom too. And I don't think we can minimize that. Okay. Glenn, you are a delight. I'm going to share your information. So guys, if you're interested, I love that star, the, the six elements and that idea, if we can truly quickly, and like you said, it doesn't take years. It could literally take weeks or months to get that propelling forward of, cha- of positive change. Um, so I love that. I'm a visual. So I love those, the six you know points on the star. Email Glenn if you have questions. It's Glenn, two N's, G-L-E-N-N at acromoff.com, A-K-R-A-M-O-F-F.com. I'll put that in the show notes. No worries, people. And also check out the website. There's information there that'll be useful uh, for the leaders out there. And that's acromoff.com. Again, I will put that in the show notes. Glenn, thank you so much for coming on this I want to say a shift. I hope it's a shift in leadership that what you're saying, the, the shift that you're already seeing in 24, the expectations coming into 2024. I really think and hope that people listen to the show and start to implement that, you know, those six points um, that you outlined. If And guys, go back, listen, re, go back in the recording um, and write them down, write the six points down, go to the website. Um, they're probably listed there, right, Glenn? Mm-hmm. Um, or reach out to Glenn to have a conversation. Communication, conversations, that's how we learn and grow and understand what we're missing. So Glenn, thank you so much for coming on. You're a uh, delight to chat with. So I appreciate that. that- Thank you so much. I very much enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, and you guys, if you're loving the show, please uh, subscribe, rate, and review so you don't miss an episode. And I do feel the love when you uh, write me reviews. I so appreciate that you find value in the show. Um, you've been listening to Enlightenment of Change with me, your host, Connie Whitman, on webtalkradio.com. I truly am inspired every week to show up for you, to have guests like Glenn, where we kind of peel back the curtain and help you see what might be that next step for you, whatever change you're going through. Because we're all dealing with something, guys, at the end of the day. How can we help and support each other? And that truly, for me, is what inspires me to do the show. I want to be a support mechanism. My guests want to be that support support mechanism. We've gone through several uh, detailed points here. Again, the star, those six elements within that star that uh, Glenn outlines is a good starting point. Information is a beautiful thing. If you do nothing with it, simply information, please take one of the ideas, implement it and see the magic that happened. Action, reaction, and magic uh, follows. So again, please be inspired. Embrace the change that you're facing. Use Glenn's ideas and tips or my stories that I share throughout the episode. Um, But I love you. I encourage you to change in a positive trajectory and make 2024 and beyond uh, great for yourself and your families. Glenn, thank you again. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, Have a great week. Be inspired, everyone. See you next week.